plant and mollusk remains from Khashoggi, Belize, um, which my co-author um, Patricia McEnany recognized. In recent decades, archaeologists working in the Maya area have increasingly focused on non-royal sites and their households. Oops, already having problems. <laughs> So here we are in the Maya area, for those of you less familiar. Resulting studies have emphasized the hierarchy and complexity prevalent among smaller sites. Scholars often interpret disparities in size and elaboration among structures at a site as evidence of household competition and differentiation. So here's an example of some different uh, structural configurations found with insights in favor of that interpretation. Taking a different tack, this paper explores the possibility of heterarchical or cooperative relationships across structures utilized by a single social and economic unit, that is a household. Several researchers have also pointed out that complexity in the Maya area could be redefined to include heterarchical networks in which elements are flexibly ranked and can, be, and can result from coordinated power structures working at various scales. By applying this perspective to multiple classic period structures at the site of Kasho, we provide a revised picture of social and economic life at the site. Oh, wrong button. <laughs> okay, so here we are back in the Maya area, and just to show you that Kasho is in northern Belize, and the close up here, where, where it's located. This paper examines plant and mollusk data from formative through classic period to show with a focus on classic period contexts, spanning 550 to 750 common era at the site of Kasho. We compare two structures that have been considered the remains of adjacent classic period households. Using plant, faunal, and other data, we track changes in the organization of activity areas at the larger and smaller structure through time. As a result, we suggest that by the classic period, households were distributed across more than one structure. And here's a simple diagram just to show where we're headed, and I'll continue to explain um, this as I go on. But you can see two distinct households uh, as an interpretation of two structures versus a uh, more uh, integrated set of structures. <coughs> So in this paper, we introduce the Khashoggi excavation contexts examined for the study, then present the botanical and faunal remains that make up the heart of the analysis. We also introduce other lines of evidence that bolster an interpretive model of a distributed household, <coughs> and then situate the research theoretically. So here's Khashoggi. It's a site of 84 hectares on, um, located on a patch of high ground between the southern arm of Pole Trouser Swamp, which you can see on the left, and side of this image, and the New River of Belize. Patricia McEnany served as principal investigator for excavations on the site from 1990 through 1998. For this study, I, my teacher, analyzed the botanical remains. We then compared this evidence to the fauna found within two four by four meter excavation units that sampled separate structures in the northern portion of the site. So here's where we'll be zooming into. Here's the northern portion of the site. Structure, I'm going to just describe the two structures that have the focus of the analysis now at the top of the screen here. Structure 54 and 89. Structure 54 is part of a basal platform group consisting of four structures around a central plaza. Within the excavation unit, there existed eight construction phases spanning the late formative period, dating from around 200 BCE through the late classic period. Eleven burials were found in this excavation con uh, context or trench rather, along with thick plaster floors and other discrete contexts. Other discrete features. Structure 89, on the other hand, and in contrast, is located 50 meters to the southeast of Structure 54. The three phases of construction found in this excavation unit dated solely to the late classic period. One disarticulated burial was found in the unit, um, which also contained earthen rather than plaster floors. Because structure 89 was built and used during the late classic period, comparison of the two structures applies only to this time. However, structure 54 samples dating to an earlier period contained rich botanical and faunal remains that are discussed here because 
they're innately significant and also because it set the stage for how the structure was used later on. So the earliest flotation samples came from a context dated ceramically to the late and terminal facets of the Katab Kash ceramic complex. And that is a Kashob specific designation spanning the late formative period. Again, that's from around 200 BCE to the early classic period or about 250 CE. Most plant remains came from a midden used in the initial construction of the structure, of structure 54. The artifact rich and possibly recycled midden included pottery shirts, beads, and fishnet sinkers, chipstone tools, both chert and obsidian, and worked bone tools and shell ornaments. The botanical sample is dominated by 32 um, seeds identified as either amaranth or hinoam, which is a less specific designation. I think they're probably amaranth, but could not be more precisely identified. And more than 50 maize cupules in addition to maize kernel fragments. Two carbonized fiber fragments were found, um, and they may be cotton based on their very small size. The midden also contained a rich faunal assemblage, as you can see listed on this slide. The presence of crocodile bone in the platform fill is particularly notable. Um, crocodile is really found outside of ritual contexts from the formative to classic periods in this region. For this reason, and because of the diversity of food-related finds, the midden may represent the remains of a feasting event. Though characterized by a highly uh, diverse animal assemblage, the Structure 54 midden contained the least diverse plant assemblage, including primarily maize and amaranth or quinoa on this show. During formative times, maize was an important status food used ritually. The amaranth or quinoa seeds from this context significantly constitute the largest collection yet found in the Maya area. Six other, uh, six other late formative as well as classic period contexts from the excavation units discussed here contain from one to three amaranth seeds per context. These lower counts have become somewhat standard in context from northern Belize when I'm looking at different um, studies that have been published lately. Uh, so amaranth was famously important as a food source for the peoples of Highland Mexico. And Gail Fritz has written of the importance of amaranth as a green in North America as well, noting the unwillingness, however, of many scholars to acknowledge the seed as an important component of ancient diets, perhaps due to our biases toward maize and larger cultigens. Now, I have no information about whether or not these um, were cultivated. I was, I was not able to tell that, uh, but I thought I'd mention that. And those small amaranth seeds are high in lysine and protein, while the greens contain a wealth of other nutrients. So it's possible that the Katab Chikash residents focused on fewer plant species in greater abundance for consumption during feasts while intensifying and diversifying the meat intake. So moving to the late classic, um, we expand the botanical analysis to a comparison between two roughly contemporaneous hearths located in adjacent structures 54 and 89, introduced earlier. The hearth within structure, structure 54, which is built on top of the rich Katachikash midden, contained a low ratio of seeds to charred wood, as well as a hog plum seed and a tobacco seed. Hog plum is a tree fruit cultivated in orchards and can be eaten raw. Their pits have been found in various sites across the Maya area. And orchards are symbols of wealth related to heritable land ownership, so cultivated fruits may convey some information related to status. Tobacco is a plant that was used primarily for ritual purposes as cigars or snuff, based on its appearance in classic period sculptures and vase paintings, and also based on its ongoing uses among Maya people. Miniature snuff jars with a glyph or tobacco have been identified dating to the late classic. And Zagorevsky and Lockmiller Newman found nicotine alkaloids in a snuff jar made in the Mirador Basin, which is shown on the left of this slide. At Kashow, a miniature jar similar in size and shape was found in an excavation unit placed in structure 68, located approximately 400 meters to the south of this hearth, and that's shown on the right. The presence of hieroglyphically identified ceramic tobacco vessels during the late classic period most likely reflects the formalization and increasing importance of tobacco's use as a status of ritual plant. So moving on to the other hearth, the hearth within structure 89, um, that hearth contained a high ratio of seeds to charred wood, including a variety of seeds from plants requiring processing for various uses. Present were more than 30 nant seeds, 30 legume cotyledons, both wild and domesticated, kohu palm nut fragments, 
seeds from two species within the grape family, and maize cupules and kernel fragments. A variety of other wild species were also found. Because the nance seeds found from the context were only four millimeters long, which is about half the minimum size of cultivated nance seeds known today, it's possible that Kusher residents collected these fruits from forest stands. Their shrinkage can also result from carbonization, as many of us know. <coughs> nance can be processed for use as food, beverage, or dye. Palm nuts could also have formed a regular part of diets at Kushow, and palm wood was used for fuel in both parts. Water vine seeds came from fruits that could have been processed for use as food, beverage, or vinegar. If people collected water vine and season vine stems as well, they can be used for cordage or medicine. In comparison, there is a marked difference between the content of the two late classic period hearths. The Structure 54 hearth contained a greater proportion of burnt wood, along with a sam uh, limited sample of plants associated with ritual and consumption that were not found in the other hearth. The Structure 89 hearth contained remains from plant processing and food pre uh, preparation, with a wide variety of wild and cultivated plant species represented. The earliest use of Structure 89 was as a kiln, which is one type of processing area, and it seems that the designation of the space as a production area continued into later times, the later phases of the construction. This interpretation of the plant evidence also corroborates with the shell data. In 1995, Cheryl Eckhart recorded the valve and opercula blanks, which you can see what that means right here on this image, um, from the apple snail shells uh, from structures 54 and 89. She was inspired by an experimental study in which Norman Hammond's field crew collected apple snails and fried them up in butter, and from which it was concluded that large snails are tough and flavorless while medium-sized snails are tender and preferable. Based on these results, Eckhart sought to determine whether people selectively harvested medium-sized snails. Re-examination of her results reveals a distinction between the size distribution of snail shells recovered from structures 54 and 89. So the valve and operculum lengths of snails from structure 54, shown in, as A and B in this image, were distributed normally around an ideal size, while the same measurements of snails from structure 89, as C and D in this image show, um, had a bimodal distribution with higher counts of large and small snails. A greater proportion of whole snail shells were found in the unit in structure 89 as well, supporting the idea that these were not the ideal snails for eating and that people did not eat them, a process that would have led to higher quantities of broken snails as people um, tried to break them and suck out the snails. Likely residents sorted and prepared apple snails at structure 89 and consumed them at structure 54. These data support the idea of an extended household that utilized multiple spaces in the northern portion of Peshoke during the late classic. So here we are back in the northern portion of the site. Residents of the household could have put Structure 89 to use as a food preparation and production center with these messy activities somewhat removed from the house. From the late formative to late classic periods, as a larger basal platform group grew, residents likely transitioned from conducting subsistence tasks in a central location <coughs> to distributing specialized activities across space. Structure 54 became a more specialized location as well for food consumption as well as ancestor veneration. So that moves us to another line of evidence, which is um, the burial data from the show. Analysis by A.J. Meyer suggests that residents with differing social identities who lived as part of the same household were buried in distinct, distinct structures during the classic period. While structure 54 contained adult males with burial accoutrements, including vessels placed over the head, structure 68 to the south primarily entombed females, multiple burials including children, and individuals without burial goods. So you can see, for those of you who are in back, it's at the bottom of this slide. Conceivably, after death, persons from the same household were distributed among structures at the site depending on their social and gendered identities. The fact that children were buried within Structure 54 during an earlier period strengthens the idea that specialized use of structures emerged during the Classic period. Sullivan and Rodney detected a similar pattern of gender, and age-based mortuary practices materialized in differential burial location at a late prehistoric Cherokee site, but to our knowledge, this practice has not been discussed for the Maya region. Finally, just to mention, comparative analysis of the form, type, 
and composition of classic period ceramics from structures 54 and 89 reinforces the different activity profiles of the two structures. But I don't have time to go into that more at this time. So now moving on to theoretical perspectives and contributions. Within kin-based corporate groups, people became social beings by activating relationships with people, places, and things, and they did so well engaged in daily activities within a particular landscape. In thinking, in thinking about the data presented here, we have found it particularly useful to consider the concept of taskscape in order to envision how people acted, as a goal stated, quote, within an ensemble of tasks performed in series or in parallel, and usually by many people working together, unquote. For example, it appears that the sampled area within Structure 89 constituted a space for the preparation not only of dietary staples, but also important products such as fiber and dye. Based on ethnographic and iconographic depictions of grinding maize and spinning and weaving cotton, these activities were gender specific and conducted primarily by women. In contrast, ethnographic and epigraphic information suggests that the ritual use of tobacco tended to be male gendered. Um, and this analysis lends a spatial aspect to the separation of gender role. Structure 89 was far enough away from Structure 54 that people could have shouted to each other, but in general, the smoke and noises of Structure 89 would have been muted for people at the larger compound. The location of the hearth on the north side of Structure 89 would have allowed those present to view Structure 54 and vice versa. A social group that spans multiple structures across a site might be called a distributed household. This echoes Gale's work on distributed objects and personhood, which is an appropriate reference if we strive to convey the idea of a social group spread across space due to task organization and specialization, and also across time as a function of activities related to ancestor veneration. The notion of a distributed household includes conceptual space for the very relationships we imagine to have been enacted across structures. This creates a different picture from that I see at the beginning of excavations I can show, namely that each separate structure housed an independent social unit. So, one final point, comparative example. Playa de Soren provides an excellent comparative example of distributed households. So you can see here that each household is labeled and there are three structures per household generally sometimes more. It is possible that the lack of such fine grain evidence such as that available at Soren has caused us to overlook the presence of this multi-structural household pattern elsewhere. However, additional insights regarding intracite interactions can be gained with continued collection and analysis of plant and animal remains and their interpretation by context. A site-wide laundry list of plant and animal remains would not have provided the analytical power to support a model of the distributed household. In conclusion, Kashov households grew during the formative period, but strong corporate relationships may not have fully formed until later classic times when population growth, land conscription, and kin-based land claims partition space. People may have depended on each other for subsistence and ritual nourishment while working together across structures and statuses. We have tried to illustrate the point using this simple diagram that I had showed earlier. And so the idea is that the boundedness of the households and the original interpretation is shown through the thicker lines and further distancing, and a range of household activities were thought to take place at both locations versus the distributed household model in which there's um, greater crossover between structures by um, people, the same group of people, and specific activities, more specific activities occurring in other places. While differential access to certain goods likely occurred, cooperation also existed within and across social groups inhabiting smaller communities. Mm -hmm. Rather than emphasizing hierarchy between structures, complexity could have been materialized in the rich hierarchical networks of distributed households. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a question or two. Yes. Um, would you call it a commune? I wouldn't call it a commune because I hadn't thought of it that way before. It's more of a corporate group, as a, a household as a corporate group um, incorporating multiple structures. But we could talk later if you want to think of that. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you, Thank Maya. You. Very well done.